Welcome to today's webinar, Medication Management. I'm your host, Janet Barker Evans. In this webinar, we'll discuss why medication management is so crucial for seniors, how senior living can help, and we're gonna share a few tips for at-home medication management. Dr. Michael Gloth is an Associate Professor of Medicine in the Division of Geriatric Medicine and Gerontology at Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine and a clinical professor of geriatrics at Florida State University College of Medicine. He's president and CEO of AMDG Naples 100 Senior Concierge and Consulting. Dr. Gloth, a Baltimore native, received his BS in chemistry and biology from the College of William and Mary in Virginia and his MD from Wayne State University School of Medicine. He currently serves on the boards of the Health and Aging Foundation and the Florida Medical Directors Association. In addition to that, he's president-elect of the Florida Geriatric Society. His publications include Medication Management in Older Adults, Handbook of Pain Relief in Older Adults, and Fit at 50 and Beyond, an International Book Award winner. Dr. Gloth was named the 2006 Clinician of the Year by the American Geriatric Society. Welcome, Dr. Gloth. Thanks so much. Pleasure to be here. Yeah. So to start us off, could you explain what a geriatrician is and why somebody might, might want to make an appointment to see one? Yeah. So just as an individual ages and they go from seeing a pediatrician to an adult medicine physician, maybe an internal medicine physician, or sometimes they'll stay with a family practice doc, but they'll switch to an older adult because pediatricians are trained in handling folks when they're younger with diseases and things that occur when they're younger. Physiologically, we change as we get older. And so folks will move to a physician who has expertise in handling adults. Similar physiologic changes, though, take place as we age. And probably the most obvious for women is menopause. But there are lots of changes that occur that you may not recognize as you get older. Drug metabolism changes, body distribution in terms of where medications are metabolized and stored, the types of diseases that are more common in older adults, all of those things change as we get older and as we age. And so getting someone who is an expert in older adults becomes an advantage in terms of functional survival, staying independent as long as possible. Uh, those things are better managed and more successfully managed by a geriatrician. So if you can get a geriatrician, which I will say they are not readily available everywhere. But if you can get one as you get older, it probably will pay you big health dividends later on. That makes so much sense when you equate it to a pediatrician, to a regular doctor. Absolutely. That makes so much sense. I'd never thought about it like that before. So when we think about older populations, why is medication management essential to understand? The older adult, as I mentioned, does have some physiologic changes that occur. And so it becomes really important that we recognize some of the complications that it can occur as an individual gets older. So diseases certainly can have an impact, certainly chronic diseases. Older adults also take more medications than most younger adults. And so making sure that those drug-drug interactions are managed appropriately so that folks don't have ill consequences from the medications that they take, that becomes very important. And then there are other things that change as an individual get, gets older, not just how they metabolize their medications, but also in terms of the number of physicians that they're seeing, the number of medical complications, changes just directly associated with aging. And so suddenly it becomes very, very important in terms of what drugs are taken, which drugs are stopped, which is also something that's important as individuals get older. So managing the medications, making sure that the time when they're taken, the types of drugs that are taken and how they interact. And even sometimes other things we'll talk about later in terms of maybe food or something like that. But it's very, very important, probably more so in older adults, because just the sheer number of drugs that they take are going to have worse complications in older adults than younger adults, even when they take the same number of drugs. That's great. I think we have a slide to pop up to talk a little bit about some of the biggest challenges that face uh, older adults when it comes to, to medication. 
Yeah, so this is a great point. So as I mentioned, it's not just the changes that are taking place in the individual. There's some characteristics about an older adult that make it really a paramount importance for us in terms of oversight of how folks are taking drugs. So the idea that while you may take a few medications, if you're getting them from one particular pharmacy all the time, a lot of times pharmacies will monitor drugs and look for drug-drug interactions. As individuals get older though, they frequently will go to more than one pharmacy. Maybe it's because they've moved, maybe it's because they're no longer picking things up from the pharmacy where they worked now that they're retired, or they've had relationships with new pharmacies compared to ones that they've had previously, or there's a pharmacy close to one of the doctor specialists, it's far away. And so you end up having them deal with multiple pharmacies. And a lot of times those different pharmacy chains or the individual pharmacy itself doesn't communicate with the other pharmacies. And so they don't know all the drugs that are being taken by one of their individuals that are a client for them. The other thing that happens, as I mentioned, these multiple medications make it more complex. For an older adult, if they're taking more than one drug, that interaction is more likely to be problematic for an older adult than a younger adult. And most older adults are actually the average is about nine different prescription medications for an older adult. And then half of them get medications from more than one doctor. And that includes samples. That can be a real problem. I've had problems with patients who have gotten a sample of a medication. I didn't know they got the sample. And the specialist, it was great for that particular organ system, but not for the patient in toto. And so other problems were complicated because of the sample that was given by the specialist. And so going to more than one doctor sometimes can make things more complex. And then unfortunately, there are some drugs that really shouldn't be prescribed for older adults. And maybe they were prescribed when they were younger and it was appropriate, but now they're older. So the drug hasn't changed, but they have. And so as it turns out, one in 12 physician visits ends up in a Beers drug, which is a drug that is really recommended to be avoided by older adults. And unfortunately, some of those Beers drugs are prescribed more commonly in women than there are in men. And interestingly, as you get older, women live a little bit longer. So we have more women in the older adult population. So this is particularly disconcerting. And then finally, there are some disease processes that make it more difficult for patients to manage their medications, dementia being one of them that's very obvious. Yeah, the, the idea of multiple pharmacies, you know, I know my doctor has a pharmacy right on site, and then my insurance plan requires me to do some things by mail order. So keeping track of it, right. it's hard today, right? There's not, you don't have your pharmacist anymore, right? That's the other problem is the mail order pharmacies, you got a lot of people using them because they're less expensive, but they don't communicate very well with your local pharmacy on many occasions. And so that does become an issue as well. So you really rely on one person, usually it's going to be that geriatrician or that primary care physician or whatever the primary care provider is, maybe it's a nurse practitioner. But the bottom line is, is you got to have one chef that's overseeing that soup, if you will. Too many chefs spoil the pot. And a lot of times that's true with too many physicians as well and too many pharmacies. Yeah. And the fact that they're seeing so many doctors, right? You may be seeing an eye doctor or an orthopedist, right? There's so many different doctors. It makes it so hard to keep track of. So you mentioned this Beer's drug. Can you explain a little bit more about what Beer's drugs are? I know we have another slide on this. Yeah. Sure. And this is very helpful in terms of the slide because it goes through some of the things that the Beer's list provides for physicians or, or other clinicians in general. So there was a time I actually sat on the Beers criteria panel. So we put together a list and it's at the time, Mark Beers, for whom the list is named, was the person who chaired that panel. And what it did was it allowed us to identify, and we looked through literally thousands of articles about adverse events in older adults. And we identified drugs that were more likely to have serious side effects in older adults compared to a younger adult population. But it doesn't just look at drugs that are inappropriate for older individuals in general. More recent beers lists have looked at drugs that are inappropriate 
for older adults who have specific medical conditions. So whereas a drug may be okay for older adults, generally, if you have a particular disease process, it may actually be problematic for them. The other thing is the newer list has listed potentially dangerous drug-drug interactions. And that's been very helpful as well because some younger adults can handle a mixture of drugs better than older adults can. And because of changes in maybe kidney function or the way drugs are metabolized otherwise, as an individual gets older, those drug-drug interactions become more serious for the older adult. And then it has talked about the fact that there are potential side effects that may exist and you just need to be a little more cautious, meaning you need to observe people, particularly early on after they get started on a drug, to make sure that they won't be problematic for older adults where they're a little bit more likely to have problems. Uh, and then there are drugs to have medications adjusted in terms of the dosage or maybe the frequency in which they're administered. And the beers list more recently has started to address that as well. So lots of helpful information for that clinician who's following the older adult. And let's face it, there are not enough geriatricians around. So this is really helpful for everyone who is prescribing it off for the older adult population. What are some other things older adults need to consider in terms of the medications? I think about, um, you know, medications where it has a little sticker that says don't drink alcohol or, you know, if you're taking supplement, I take a lot of supplements and, you know, my doctor's always asking me what I'm taking to make sure. What are things like that or other things that adults should consider when they're older in terms of the medication? Look, the supplement industry is a multi-billion dollar industry. It is unusual for me to walk into the home of one of my older adult patients, and I do a fair amount of phone house calls. And interestingly, I'll get patients to bring in all their drugs into the office, and they bring them all in. They don't bring in their supplements or sometimes some of the other things that they're taking. And so when I'm in the home seeing them, they'll say, and I'll ask, do you have any supplements? they can actually go get them, either pull them out of the refrigerator or they can get them out of wherever they're keeping their supplements. And it's not always with their prescription drugs and they don't always think that supplements yeah. might actually cause a problem. And so it is important to look at that. It is also important to talk to people about when they take their medication, whether they take the medication with food or not with food. Some drugs are absorbed much better with food. Other medications like thyroid medication really should be taken first thing in the morning without anything else, including other medications. A lot of osteoporosis drugs need to be taken just by themselves. Uh, some of the bisphosphonate drugs like uh, alendronate, those are, which is probably the original of the bisphosphonate types of agents for osteoporosis. It's generic now, so it's very commonly administered. But if you take that drug, even with a cup of coffee or another medication, you will absorb almost none of the drug. Even when you take it properly, you only absorb about 0.7% of the drug. So it's absolutely imperative that you take that on an empty stomach. Other drugs should be taken with meals. Uh, there are some drugs that can cause a little bit of nausea. And so sometimes we'll give that to people at night before they go to bed. And it's one of the reasons why statins, for example, were recommended to be taken at nighttime, because you'll be asleep when that time comes that you get a little nausea. And so it doesn't really have any impact. Uh, so there are lots of things like that. You mentioned alcohol. Some drugs are absorbed very differently in the presence of alcohol. And you tell somebody to take a drug in the evening. Well, a lot of our older patients, they have their cocktail hour in the yeah. evening. It's very important social gathering to do that. And so recognizing that there may be some interactions there. Uh, those kinds of things are really important. The duration, how long apart can people take drugs? Uh, you take it twice a day. Well, taking it before and after lunch isn't really twice a day. And you've got to really stretch some of these medications out for longer periods. And so all of those things become very, very important in terms of oversight and management. You know, it's interesting when you talk about what time of day and that something should be with food, some should be without. I'm thinking right now of my little pill box that I have all my supplements and medicines and I got one for morning and one for night. And I, when you're saying that, I'm thinking, boy, I don't know if I should be taking all those in the morning together. Maybe you should, some of those shouldn't be with breakfast. So it's interesting, even tools that help us sometimes, we have to know a little bit more about it, right? Right. Yes. 
So and I loved your, your comment on people bringing medicines. My mom would always put them all in a bag and take them to the doctor. We love that when that happens yeah. because they get them all in there. That's great. Right. And you're like, whoever remembers what the milligrams are or whatever. Um, I've even found some people that have the wrong drugs in a pill box that is labeled for something else. And that's a real shocker when you're going through the medication and you say, wait a minute, that drug shouldn't look like this. And it's interesting. That's great for the doctor to see. Yes. So it can be very helpful. Do you have any examples that you could share with us of non-compliance issues that you've seen in older adult patients? I, I can uh, talk about a lot of <laughs> circumstances like that, obviously. But since I talked a little bit about the specialists and, and getting a medication, I had a patient that we were seeing who was an older individual living in an assisted living environment and not having their drugs monitored by the assisted living folks. And sometimes you can have your drugs managed, they'll administer them, and that's a very helpful thing for some individuals. Uh, this individual was taking care of his own medications. He was also the caregiver for his wife, who was more infirm than he was. And one day he had a syncopal event, he passed out. So this was a very good assisted living facility. And they called right away and I went over and saw him. And one of the things that we always do when we get vital signs on our patients is we do it while they're seated and standing. So we look for what's called orthostatic hypotension. And that is a drop in blood pressure when they stand up. Well, sure enough, as we were trying to figure out what was going on with this gentleman, he was really not prescribed any medication from us that should have really caused a drop in blood pressure. Yet when he stood up, he dropped his systolic blood pressure, that top number, 30 millimeters of mercury. So he obviously had a reason for passing out and we needed to correct that. And so I went through the list of drugs and I couldn't find anything that was causing a problem for him. And so I just started stopping one medication at a time. And sure enough, we get finished. And at the end of the drugs, I said, this is what I want you. I don't want you to take any more medication at all. And I want to see what happens to your blood pressure. So I came in the next day. Blood pressure was fine. No drop. No more syncopal events. At this point, I wanted to resume some of his medications. So we started them one at a time. Now, he wasn't on a lot. We had been working with him for a while. And we actually stopped many more drugs than we start. And so I think probably about the fourth or fifth drug was the end of the drugs that we had resumed and he still had no orthostatic hypotension. So I said to him, listen, I gotta tell you, I'm not really sure why you had that drop in your blood pressure, but now we start all your medications back and you're fine, so I guess we can continue this, and if it happens again, let me know. He said, well, can I start all my drugs again? I said, sure, everything we started, you're, you're good, you don't have any problem. And he said, what about the one my urologist gave me? I said, what? his urologist had given him a medication to help relax his urethral sphincter because he had a large prostate, a drug that's commonly given to people that have BPH or benign prostatic hypertrophy. Yet it is also a drug that can lower blood pressure. And sure enough, this urologist had given him some samples and he had been taking them. Well, right then and there, we knew what the problem was. And sure enough, a couple of days later, I got the consultation note from the urologist who told me, hey, we started him on this medication for his prostate. And of course, I had already called him by that time and said, he can't take that drug. And so there are times when compliance isn't even related to the individual patient. Sometimes it's because of medications that I don't know somebody's taking. And so that can be an issue as well. Uh, I have lots of examples of patients who decide to take twice as much drug half the period of time, instead of taking it four times a day, they're going to take it two times a day, but they get the total drug, but it doesn't have the same effect because you can't stretch it out that way. Or the two together cause an adverse event that would not have occurred from the lower dose of the medication. So lots of examples out there, but it does resonate that it's not just the patients that can sometimes cause the problems. Sometimes we physicians cause the problems ourselves. The free sample, it's like, oh, good. 
I right. don't have to buy this. The doctor gave me a sample with the cost of medicine. It's like, that's great. Who even thinks to say, oh, by the way, doc, this doc gave me that. Like, it's an eye opening right now because you think about all these things and you're like, oh, yeah, I took the one in the afternoon because I wasn't going to be around that night. Was that even smart? Yeah, I counsel my patients now not to change any medication unless they talk to me first, even if another pres- physician prescribes it. I say it's great if they prescribe it. Don't fill the prescription until you talk to me. And then once we have that conversation, uh, we're good to go. And I think that kind of oversight, since I'm looking at everything related to the patient rather than just one organ system, I think overall that makes things a little better for the the patient. I think a lot of people assume that electronic medical records do magical things too, right? They think, oh, it's the same hospital system. They must be reading it. Your doctor doesn't know that another doctor put a note in, like they didn't read it. You know, right. That happens too. Mm-hmm. We, we expect magic in the system. So. Um, so, okay, let's talk a little bit about loved ones. If you're caring for somebody who's getting older, whether it's a spouse, a parent, whatever, what are some signs that your loved one might need help with managing their medications? Yes. So it, we've got many clues that can arise. And One of them is if the individual is managing their own medication and they say to you, hey, I need a refill on this drug, and you go in and you you look at that pill bottle and it says this drug was prescribed 30 pills on January the 1st, and now it's March, and they're only filling that prescription in March, that's two months late, two months beyond what should have been the period of time for that medication that need to be refilled. That's a clue. The other thing is it can happen on the other side. You go in to fill a prescription and the pharmacy says, hey, we've we've filled this. There should be plenty of medication left. They should not have run out yet. So occasionally, maybe a physician tells them double up on the medicine. And that means we need to write another prescription for twice the amount. So the pharmacy knows what's going on. But that also may be a red flag that those medications are being taken too frequently, that they are not really compliant. And then the question becomes, why are they not compliant? Is it that they're having pain and they need more control of the pain? Or is it a situation where they just forgot they took the medication? And a lot of times, even in my own household, uh, I'll have somebody say to me, my wife in particular, God bless her, but... (laughs) Uh, she'll, she takes thyroid medication and she's given me permission to talk to everybody about this because she's a really great example of hypothyroidism and, and that kind of thing. But it's a medication that needs to be taken first thing in the morning. And that's one, as I mentioned, no food. You really want to take that before you take your other medications. So sometimes she'll say to me that I take my thyroid medication. And one of the things about uh, some of the thyroid medications, it actually colors your tongue. <laughs> she'll hold her tongue out. So I will tell you, my wife sticks her tongue out at me very commonly. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Mostly to find out whether she took that medication in the morning and, and she forgets. But but it's easy thing to, to do, especially when you, you first wake up and you take it, then you go to the restroom or whatever. You come back and did I take that this morning? So it's it's the kind of thing that can happen. But when it's happening very frequently, and it's happening multiple times during the day, a lot of times that becomes an issue in terms of cognition, and then it may be pathologic, and you wanna create some mechanism to help people in terms of how they take their medication, reminders, maybe pill boxes, things like that. And and there are lots of other things that can be done to help people, uh, especially if they have lots of medications which are more complicated. Do you have any tips on how to approach that subject? Because obviously you're talking to your parent, right? We we all get pushed back on the, you know, you're my child. Stop telling me like any tips on how to approach that subject, whether it's a spouse, parent, whatever. Yeah, it can be a little challenging in terms of identifying somebody, one who's having problems and the other is, is helping them. Keep in mind, some of these medications are very expensive. And so when you're filling it earlier, that's a cost to the individual and say, you know, you you went through that prescription faster than usual. Are you, you, is there something we can do to maybe help you regulate when you take your medication and having that kind of a discussion, one saves you money, mom. (laughs) And two, 
uh, it, it, look, we all have trouble. You're getting to be on a lot of medications. Are there some things we can do to help you in terms of keeping track of this? You, you say to somebody, I don't know how you keep track of all these medications. I don't think I could do it. Well, that's a great intro to get you to have that conversation and then work with some things to help in terms of the compliance overall. Yeah, that's great. Like those can be hard conversations. Oh, yes. Are there ways and in what ways can senior living help with medication management? We touched on this earlier, but what are some specific ways on that? I I talked a little bit about that patient that didn't have medication oversight. Medication oversight can be really helpful. So if you're in a senior living environment, uh, if you're in assisted living, that can be a feature that's provided through the assisted living, much as they may offer laundry service. Well, they oftentimes will offer oversight in terms of medication. And that may mean just checking to be sure that you took your medicine, or it may be that they actually come in and give you the medication. And so those are options that are out there. Some senior living folks even have a mechanism in place where you can get called to remind you to take your drug. A lot of them will provide mechanisms for you in the house. Maybe it's pill boxes. You talked about you have a pill box that's morning pills and afternoon pills. Those are very commonly used. They can get filled the week before and the the facility can help do that. And then you just take them each day and the next week they fill them all again. You take your pills in the morning, you take your pills in the evening and you go through each day. And that helps you in terms of keeping track of what you've taken and what you haven't taken. There are some devices that are out there that actually will administer medications and sound an alarm. So, so there are a variety of things that are out there. I have Alexa remind me every morning to take my vitamins because even though I have them in the little container, if I don't go to it, right? What right. are some other yeah. organizational tools, assistive technology apps? What are some of those? And I think we have a slide to share on some of these as well. Yes. So there are a variety of devices that are out there. We talked a little bit about the pill boxes that provide mechanisms for folks to be able to actually uh, see what they take when they take. Uh, We also talked about a device that's out there that you can fill it with the medications and it will actually have an alarm or even a voice that says, time to take your medication. And it will drop the pill out when it's appropriate. And so that's really good. Uh, the first thing you have here is the MediPack, the MediDose Pack. That's a marvelous thing that the pharmacy oftentimes will provide. A lot of the facilities out there, if they have a pharmacy in-house, will provide all their medications this way. But in essence, it's sort of like your pill box, except it has each pill individually wrapped and you just punch it out of the dose pack and you take your medication and you know it's been taken because it's not in that slot anymore. And it tells you when the next one is supposed to be taken and what the medication is. And so it really leaves very little room for error. You don't have people putting the wrong pills in the wrong bottle because it comes the way it is. And so it is probably a safer way to administer medications and a reliable way to monitor to make sure people are taking what they're supposed to when they're supposed to take it. Here's another reminder, this, this actually can be programmed into your phone. You can put it onto your computer, but it'll sound, sound a chime and it gives you an alert when you're supposed to take your medication. That's really helpful for people that have to take something four times a day. And you can put that into your phone and it's hard to remember four times a day. I have trouble doing that. It, if you take something once a day, it's probably a little easier, especially if you take it in the morning when you first get up. When you start getting multiple times during the course of the day with multiple drugs, it does become more challenging. And these kind of reminders that you can put either on your phone or some other device can be yeah. very helpful. Yeah. We did it. We did a webinar a little over a year ago on technology. So an Alexa, a Google Home, a Google Echo. These are oh, all things you. that you could just tell them. Remind me at two, four, and eight, whatever PM to take medicine. It's a great thing that it's just something it that always wonderful. says take medicine. Yeah. Very good. Yes. And here's one of the things I was talking about in terms of a dispenser, where you can program this to administer medications when they're supposed to. A lot of these will have either an alarm or it will verbally say time to take, and it may even tell you which drug it is that you're supposed to take. And some of them will either tell you it's time to take such and such, the pill will come out and it'll say, remember to take it with food. <laughs> you know, so, so some of these are very sophisticated. 
Are there other resources that people can turn to for medication management online or, or some, some good source of info? Sure. There, there are a few websites that I find particularly helpful. This slide is a great illustration. So the one at the top says Health and Aging Foundation. That's actually a foundation of the American Geriatric Society. Uh, I actually sit on the board for the Health and Aging Foundation. It's a marvelous organization that provides lots of very reliable medical education and tools for the general public. And I would strongly recommend folks with other questions, not just related to medication management, but to take a look at that healthandaging.org website. Uh, but it does have some good tips in terms of managing medications on there and polypharmacy as well. The other one that you have up there is National Institute on Aging, which is a great resource. I used to sit on the National Advisory Council on Aging to NIH. And that's a group that oversees grants and things like that to the National Institutes of Health related to aging. And this is a website that was developed through the government. And it's a very reliable website and I know the government's getting a lot of hassle right now in this time of COVID about whether information is good or bad. This is a great website in terms of being reliable, useful information, very helpful for the general public. And I would recommend folks to go to this uh, website that's run by the National Institute on Aging, and that's part of the National Institutes of Health, and a wonderful resource for managing medications, but lots of other topics that are common in an older adult population that need to be addressed. And uh, these are two very reliable, useful, good websites to give you helpful information. And you don't have to question whether, well, I got this off of, I don't want to be too critical about Dr. G or anybody else like that. Oh. I'm not talking about me when I say Dr. G, but uh, the reality of it is, is there are some websites that are out there give you lots of information, but not very useful information and cause more problems than they resolve, I think. Well, that gets to my next question, because my doctor is always warning me to stop talking to Dr. Google. She's <laughs> like, you know how to call me. Stop looking things up on your own. And because she's like, you don't know where you're going. So with that in mind, are there places people should not look? Like just Googling like me, I can convince myself I have any disease by Googling my symptoms. Yeah, I don't want to disparage any particular websites, but but you've already, I think, talked about some very popular websites that are out there where a lot of folks go and they get information. And, and I spend an inordinate amount of my time with my patients talking to them about information that they've gotten that's not reliable and where it doesn't apply to them. And they say, well, I'm sure I have this, this, and this. And for a lot of older adults, they have multiple complaints that are associated with multiple medical problems. And it's not all related to just one thing. It's much more common in a younger adult population to have four or five symptoms related to a single illness. That's much less common in an older adult population. And you really need someone who spends time with you getting a very good history and also doing a very good clinical exam. And uh, I spend a lot of time with our medical students. I, I have third and fourth year students that work with me on a routine basis and teaching them clinical examination skills and how much you can learn from that as opposed to ordering just a ridiculous number of tests. And if you get a good history and a good physical, a good clinician generally will have a pretty good idea of what's going on. Uh, but trying to get all that information just on a website, I even have difficulty when I'm trying to do telemedicine when I'm looking at somebody that additional advantage of being able to do an examination, et cetera, is, is going to help people much, much more. And I don't want to be overly critical of this. I think it's wonderful that people are becoming more educated and getting more information about their own health. But there's a reason why we spend an awful long time in medical school. I mean, I, in addition to the four years of college, it was four years of medical school a year of internship, two years of residency, three <laughs> years of geriatric fellowship before I actually went out on my own seeing patients. And so it, it, is, it, it is much more complex than spending a few minutes online and trying to figure out what you have. <laughs> Good point for us all to remember. <laughs> so we're now at the point where we're going to answer some Q&A. The first one is a great question. I want to know the answer to this one too. What age should one consider moving to a <laughs> geriatrician? It is a very common question. In my practice, I don't see anyone less than the age of 65. There are some people that argue it could go as low as 55 if they have a lot of 
comorbid conditions. There are other geriatricians who only see people over the age of 85, but I think most commonly we're talking about 65 because of physiologic changes that occur in terms of how organs function and some anatomical changes that occur as we get older as well. And disease processes that are more common start to really manifest themselves after the age of 65. So I think most of us are content to use 65 as a cutoff. Uh, we have a question coming in from Facebook and from Zoom about the beers list. Can a lay person access the beers list to check the medications their spouse or parent is taking to see if there's anything that might be problematic? Yes, they can. Uh, they can go to the Health and Aging Foundation website at healthandaging.org. The American Geriatric Society's website also has a copy of that. And I think that's available actually to the general public as a PDF. It is a little technical in some aspects, but I think most people could at least look at the medications that are on the list and see whether or not they had a list of those drugs, or whether they were taking any individuals. I do want to caution people that just because it's on the list doesn't mean you can't take one of those drugs. It's just generally that it would be inappropriate for an older adult. And you want somebody who has real expertise deciding whether or not the merits outweigh the risk that are higher in the older adult population. And from an advocacy standpoint, a great thing to bring up to your doctor, right? And say, hey, oh, I saw yeah. this, right? So that's where being informed is great because you could say, hey, heard about the Spears list, look this up. And the doctor may say no, because the amount we have you on whatever, but it's great to know that to be informed. Yeah, I spend a lot of time educating physicians actually about the beers list and, and suggesting drugs other than what are on the beers list and alternatives. And the beers list more recently, the articles that have come out on the beers list have actually started to list alternative agents compared to those that are on the list. So a little safer options for us. Mm -hmm. it, here's another great question. Is a geriatrician covered by insurance Medicare? Generally, they are, and they are physicians like other physicians are out there that specialize in other things. So your cardiologist is probably covered, your geriatrician is covered, your internist would be covered, your pediatrician would be covered. Well, not by Medicare, let me qualify that. <laughs> <laughs> Generally not by Medicare, but uh, certainly the older adult, if you can get a, a geriatric specialist, that would be the what I would recommend, despite my bias here, I, I think it makes pretty logical sense to think about a geriatrician, especially if an older individual is more frail. Mm -hmm. Now, I will say there are some physicians that are concierge physicians. And so concierge physicians usually charge a fee upfront. <clears throat> I can tell you in Collier County here, most of the geriatricians are actually concierge physicians. That's and actually, I mean, a lot of the good internists are concierge physicians down here too. So there is a certain amount of bureaucracy with Medicare and some physicians have dropped out of Medicare because of the regulations and the burdensome, well, not just regulations, but the burdensome risks that are associated with Medicare. And so because of that, there are some physicians who have dropped out of Medicare. Here's a question from someone that says, I'm worried about my mom when she's out and running errands. Should she keep a list of medications with her or should she carry all her medications with her? What's the best protocol? So... When an older adult is out living their life, which we want them to do, we want them to go out and shop, we want them to run their errands, they don't necessarily need to carry all their medications with them. But I think it always makes sense to have a list of your medications with you in case you have a problem. I can tell you when EMS comes on the scene, anytime I've been on the scene with a patient who's had a problem, when EMS has gotten there, they've always asked me, even when I'm not in the emergency room or anyplace else, if I'm sitting there out in the community having dinner and somebody has a problem and I go over to help them, when EMS, EMS comes, they always ask, what medications are you taking? And so if you have that list readily available, that's a very helpful thing should you have something happen more urgently. My aunt keeps it on her notes on her phone. <laughs> so it's that's always funny. right there. It's a great thing to do. And I think having access to that is, is a very helpful thing. Not as helpful if you're unconscious, of course, but. Right, you but, don't know, but. Right, but nonetheless, most urgent circumstances, you're not unconscious and, and having a list of those medications. Helpful. Is very Better helpful. than not having it. We have yeah. a couple of questions about mail-in as well as the medications that are packed together. 
is it safe to have a company pack these things together? Is the company going to know what can and can't be combined together? And how reliable are these services in catching medications that may not go together? So there's not a set answer to that. There are some companies that are excellent at doing this. Uh, they're very, very good. They, mm -hmm. The pharmacists that are involved in the process, most of the circumstances where this happens, there are pharmacists that are involved and the pharmacists are pretty good about looking at those kinds of combinations that are potentially harmful. But to make a blanket statement there, if they're all good or they're all bad, I don't think that's really legitimate, just like all physicians are not good and not all physicians. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because it came in from the co-packing as well as the mail-in service. Yeah, it doesn't hurt to bring in those kinds of packets into the physician office when you bring in your list of medications. And we tell people, bring in your drugs, bring it in in that packaging yeah. and make sure that the, what is combined is actually appropriate to be combined. That's a good, yeah, good idea. All right, here's a good one. My dad doesn't like to take his medication. He says it makes him feel old. Do you have <laughs> any tips on ways around this or how to address it with him so he'll take it? I don't know. I'm taking medicine, like we're, then we're all feeling old that we have to take medicine. Do you have any advice or tips for this person? I, I will tell you, when, when I've had patients come into me and I go through their list and I say, I think we can probably stop a few of these drugs and you actually may feel better their eyes light up. I don't know very many people who want to take more medication. Now, I do know there are patients that I have who, when they have a problem, they think immediately I'm going to write a prescription. And I don't always do that. And that they question that sometimes. But the reality of it is, is nobody wants to spend all day long taking drugs. Right. And at least not what we're talking about, how we're talking about it. So the reality of it is there may be medications that are needed, but there also may be medications that are not needed. And I think that concept of going to a geriatrician can really be helpful. I, I, there's no question in our practice, we stop many more drugs than we start. It usually makes people feel better. They actually have fewer side effects when you do that. Some drugs that have been on board for a long time don't need to be continued. And some drugs that were started by other clinicians you just need to have the courage to walk in there and say, hey, we're going to give this a trial. I don't think you need to be on this. I don't have really good notes from the other physician, or maybe the other physician is not even alive anymore. And we're going to give a trial and see how this goes. And it just means you need to communicate pretty much up front. But as things accrue, there are more drugs that are needed in terms of managing certain medical conditions. I talk to my patients sometimes about exercise. Exercise is likely to make you feel better. It's likely to help you have a longer functional survival, meaning you're going to be more active the older that you get. And it's sometimes more about that than chronological age. And sometimes the medications are going to do that as well. And, and I remember seeing a funny cartoon that said, would you like to exercise an hour a day or be dead 24 hours a day? And Sometimes that's the way it is with medications. Uh, there are some medications that are literally needed to stay alive. And so that discussion about what's really important and what isn't, and recognizing that the pure number of medications are more likely to cause problems in older adults. And so maybe that, that dad who says, I'm, I'm taking too many drugs, needs to have somebody really review those medications to see if there aren't some that can be discontinued. And that includes supplements. So... Yeah. I think that's a great combo to have with the doctor and enlist the doctor in that too. So that's great. I know my doctor always tells me regarding that exercise movement is medicine. I'm like, oh, I love that. Yes, good. That's very good. How often is the beers list updated and how often should I go back and check it? So the beers list gets updated every few years. So 2015, then 2019. And there's another one due to come out pretty soon. So we may see another one in 2022. I think it's, they're, they're putting that together right now. Is there a technology or device that it will allow me to know my mother did take her medication? She does not live with me. And so the about? only way you can really tell if the individual has taken the medication is those, if you're using the pill boxes, you, if the mom's reliable, you can ask her, is the pill box empty for that day? And the other thing you can do is, hey, mom, put it on FaceTime. Let me see your pill boxes. And you can actually look and see what's been taken and what hasn't been taken. Uh, short of using something that shows that or having one of those electronic devices that says, 
hey, take your medicine and it drops in the cup and hopefully it's not four drugs still in the cup by the end of the day that haven't been taken. Those kinds of things are the only ways to really check up on it. If, if your mom doesn't want you to know whether she took a medication and she's with it mentally, she's going to be able to hide it from you. And I can tell you, my father-in-law, when he died, there were drugs he didn't want to take. And when, <laughs> when he, we were cleaning up his house, there was a little spot that he had behind his bed and he probably had 30 pills back there that he just didn't want to take them. And so he put them behind the bed and it was, a, and nobody knew about it until after he died. So, uh, and it, it wasn't because uh, he actually died in an automobile accident. So it wasn't related to his medications, whether he took them or not. So I can't tell you whether he was on too many drugs or not, but I know this, that he didn't want to take drugs and nobody knew he didn't take some of the medication that he was supposed to be taking. So. I know you said at the top of this too, when it comes to, if you're not refilling, right? If you go to your mom's house and she's past time to need a refill, clearly she's not taking it, right? So there's things like that or re refilling too soon. Like those things are triggers too, but on a day-to-day -day basis, that might be hard, but maybe that device, maybe that device has some interface that says, but you're right, she still has to take them out of the cup. Right, so. Here's a great question. It seems like my medications are constantly changing from generic to some kind of formula. Does that affect the way it works in my body? And do I need to talk to my doctor to adjust any supplements I take? So the supplement issue is, is more of a problem for me than the medication changes going from generic or from one prescription plan to another. So prescription plans generally have a contract with certain providers. And so you may be taking one formulation of a drug and at the end of the year when you switch prescription plans or it gets switched for you, you find that you can't keep taking that brand name that you were taking before. And a lot of people get very concerned about that. Most of the generics are quite equivalent to the brand names. And most, for one brand name is not a lot different from the other brand name if it's the same generic drug. There are certain circumstances where that doesn't apply. And there are not very many but you will have some patients who have a reaction to a generic that they did not have to the brand name. Or when a brand name is switched from one brand to another, they may have a response that they did not have. In those circumstances, it's important to document that there's a problem with the switch and work with the prescription plan to go back to the previous formulation. That usually is very difficult to do. These prescription plans do not like to do that. It's a lot of work for your physician. Oftentimes I have to appeal it. Usually when I get to the appeal process, I get approval, but it is a bit of a hassle to do it. It's unfortunate that the prescription plans have these folks that are making decisions who have never seen the patient, really don't know their medical history, and yet they can make those decisions based on the insurance. Now, there's always an option to pay out of pocket and not go that way, but some of these drugs are pretty expensive and that doesn't become a realistic option for some individuals. Most drugs, however, are fine when you make the switch and do not cause a problem. Anyone who has ever had to argue with your pharm pharmacy provider, it's an interesting couple of well, afternoons. <laughs> it is a challenge, I can it tell. It really is. Wastes a lot of our time, unfortunately. Absolutely. Okay, here's another great question. I have some drugs filled at a compound pharmacy. I've had experience with this before. Do they typically interact with my main pharmacy for drug interactions, or should I provide them with a list from my main pharmacy? Compounding is, is challenging. And it's, I will tell you, I've used compounding for some drugs because it's much less expensive in some circumstances. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. And when you go to a compounder, the pharmacist can compound an agent and provide it to you, but oftentimes the absorption is not consistent. And that means serum levels that you're going to have are not the same. And usually to compound it, it requires some other congener in there to keep the medication and allow it to either get through the skin or keep it together with another drug. And sometimes people have reactions to those congeners that are in the product. So there are times when you can compound. As a physician, generally my patients will tell me when they're getting something from a compounder 
And I have to prescribe it through that compounding pharmacy. So I know that they're getting it through that mechanism. And it, it, it just requires a little more vigilance on my part to make sure that their levels are getting high enough. Uh, some men who are hypogonadal end up taking testosterone, can be a very expensive drug. It isn't always covered adequately by their prescription plan. And to go to a compounder, you have to follow their te testosterone levels and make sure they don't get too high and also that they do come back into a normal range. And so it requires a little more effort when somebody uses somebody to compound a drug, but there are times when you can't get medications into somebody, particularly if they're in hospice or something like that. Mm -hmm. And folks who do compounding can be very helpful with those routes of administration. I, uh, if you haven't had experience with the compound pharmacy, it's like it does introduce a whole different world of stuff, right? It is. It can be helpful at times. It, it can be problematic at times too. So it requires a little more vigilance on our part. All right. Here's a question. Um, again, about mail order services, how reliable is the mail order service in catching these things that shouldn't be going together? And I'm guessing it depends on the mail order service, maybe to your point before. If it's through a prescription plan, there are some that are pretty good. And I'll get a notice that says, you realize your patient is taking this, you want them taking both of these drugs. For me, most of the time, it's an annoyance because I follow drugs pretty closely, but I'm sure that that warning or that uh, message of concern is helpful in general. And so uh, it, it does, I think, help us to avoid complications from things that maybe generally should not be combined or in some circumstances are not advisable to combine. So I don't have any criticism with that. Not all mail order services do that. Uh, the ones that are not specific through your prescription plan, a lot of times those are just, you order it online, you get what you get, and they have no idea what else you're taking. You're just getting that particular drug from that service. They have no oversight whatsoever. And so you really rely heavily on your clinician who's prescribing for you to know all the drugs that you're taking and, and making sure that you don't have those interactions. Oh, we had a comment come in from Teresa who says that with her mom, she had a home health care service come in, set up her meds each week, do the refills, another service, give the reminder. So there's other options out there too. She's sharing with us that she's used. So thank you for that, Teresa. So we're at the end and Dr. Gluff, I want to thank you for joining us today. This was such an informative session. I love it. And thank you to all of you for watching and for being here and asking all your great questions. As we said, we're going to be emailing you a recording and a transcript of this webinar, so you'll be able to view it again and share this with your family and friends. Please come back and join us again in March for our next webinar, Travel After COVID-19. <laughs> Should be a good one. <laughs> Appreciate it, and thank all of those in the audience who participated and watched. Great. Thank, thank you. Me. Each of our webinars here features a different subject. You can visit brookdale.com slash in the know to discover more. We hope to see you again soon. Until next time. We hope you all stay safe, happy, and well. Thank you.